In celebration of Black History Month, Oklahoma Gardening is partnering with Langston University to bring to you a feature presentation. Micah Anderson, who is a horticulture educator for Langston University, joins us as he portrays his father, L.A. Anderson, as he became a farmer in Haskell, Oklahoma in the 1940s. It's a unique look at the struggles and perseverance of a black farmer in the 1940s in Haskell, Oklahoma. My name is Micah Anderson. I'm an uh, Extension Heritage educator for uh, Langston University. And um, it's Black History Month, uh, February the 10th, and so I'm going to uh, do a little skit. Uh, and I'm uh, acting out as my, my dad uh, coming up, growing up through uh, the 30s and 40s and into the 70s. My name is uh, Lee Arthur Anderson. I was born in Snake Creek uh, community uh, near Bigsby, Oklahoma. Um, and then I, uh, my uh, mother uh, and father moved there from uh, Louisiana. Um, and then eventually I moved to uh, down by Haskell. And uh, this, this area right here uh, is the area that we eventually settled uh, where we had our farm, and you can see over here the Anderson farm. My mother lived across the road, and the church is up top, and then another church over here, and we all fellowshiped and um, had uh, go to church services together um, back in the day. When I got to the Haskell area, I met my wife, Rosalie Anderson, and uh, her dad was a farmer, and he mentored, he mentored me uh, and helped me be, become a farmer, and me and my wife decided that we was going to be farmers, and that's what we really struck out to be. We put our passion, it was our passion, and we worked together, and uh, she was awesome as far as cooking and canning and raising kids, all those good things. This is a, a picture of all the kids after they're grown. Uh, so my wife, Rosalie, had 11 kids, uh, but she, uh, 10 of us were grown. Uh, one boy died at three days. Uh, but this is all the kids after they're grown. Uh, we started out with like three cows, and, uh, but we wound up with a herd uh, of about 100. So um, we were blessed, and uh, it was hard. There was a struggle, but we worked hard, and, and, things, and life was good. Back in, in those days, uh, when we and uh, uh, when we after I got married, and soon, a young man, a black man in the community, getting married. First thing he, he winds up becoming a deacon, and so as a deacon in the church, then whenever somebody would die, and he was a, usually called on to be a pallbearer. And then the pallbearers had to go out and dig the graves. In that time, there was no backhoes, and so it was a, it was like this shovel uh, became too much of my friend. You know. I, one of my best farmers, friends that I knew, Willie Walker, um, had to dig his grave. But, uh, but that was just one of the things. That was just part of life. And we had to, that was some of the things that the, the black, the black, in the black community that was real common uh, until later on we did get the mechanized equipment. Uh, this is a picture of the first tractor, and then that was uh, the first diesel tractor. But here is a, a, a document that I want to talk about, um, that we, uh, uh, when I bought my, this is actually when I bought my truck. Before I bought my, my first truck in 1940, uh, 1949, I, uh, I had bought a tractor with a trailer. And uh, the trailer, we bought that in 1945. And when I uh, got ready to buy the tractor, I was going to buy a smaller tractor, a B Formal. And my, grub, and my dad, father-in-law, says he had ran it, found a guy that had a uh, one-year-old H from all, which was like the first tractor that they had, had bought. And so he said, you're going to need that bigger tractor because you already got three kids and another one on the way. And so I decided to go uh, to the bank and see if I could persuade the banker to uh, lend me the money. And so when I get to the banker, the banker says, 
Well, we decided we want we wanted to, we was going to lend you the money on the ball, smaller tractor, the B farm all because it's new and got a warranty on it. I said, yeah, but the the bigger tractor has all the equipment, has a trailer, has all this stuff, and uh, it's only a year old. And so he finally convinced the, the banker that uh, that was a good deal. And so he went and got he got the money and went and got the tractor and loaded the everything inside the tractor, put the cultivator on it. Uh, backed up to a tree, pulled the disc up into to the, to the trailer, and then he hooked the plow on the back because it had wheels on it. And he was able to take all that equipment home. But also, until he got the truck, he was able to take produce and different things to Bigsby, to Haskell, to different places where he uh, was selling produce. So uh, that, the, tra the tractor was a, great, uh, was a great accessory, and not only that, I uh, put a wide front end on the tractor from, that we got from Montgomery Ward and made it good for going down the road instead of the narrow front end. And so, but when we got, when I, I don't have the document to go back when I bought the tractor, but when I bought the truck, this is a document, a 1949 uh, Chevrolet one ton truck. Uh, the farm all, had to, this is all the other stuff that I had to put up when I bought the truck. Uh, the farm all seven foot tandem disc, the farm all two bottom uh, 14 inch tractor plow, uh, the farm all two row tractor cultivator, the small all uh, two uh, tractor planter, the David Bradley 16 foot trailer with rubber tires on it, uh, one, ma one bay mare 10 years old, uh, one black mare 10 years old, five cows mixed colors, uh, one red heifer, one black brood sow, and three white shoats. Uh, so for those that don't know what the shoats are, that, was a, that would be pigs. And so, uh, and all the crops to be planted and raised by the merger in the season of 1950. So then I had to put up all my crops for the year uh, after that I bought, bought the vehicle. Uh, so, but, but it was amazing. We always had uh, good, we always made crops. And I uh, thank God we didn't lose anything because I was still planning on having more kids to help us on the farm. And uh, if I wouldn't have been able to pay these bills, I may have had to move to town. By the time I got the truck, I was really doing really well with my farming operation. Uh, so I, wound up, I got a letter from the Muskogee County Extension Office. And that letter reads, Muskogee County has approximately 4,000 farm men, women, boys, and girls. So many of these women, boys, and girls in Muskogee County were African-American or black people, black children, with whom the county extension agent and home demonstration agent are trying to help in an effort to make a better life living. This means that, no, that we, need to help in we need help in reaching such a large farm population. You have been selected as a helper and a leader in order that you may know definitely how you can best serve. We are inviting you to attend a leader training meeting, which will be held in the county agent's office Saturday, March 5th at 9.30 a.m. We will not keep you more than an hour or so. If you are here on time, we are hoping to have an organization specialist from Stillwater with us. So this was a, a special letter that I got uh, back in uh, 1949. And uh, so I was constantly moving forward in my uh, farming operation. One of the things that kept me, I was able to, to do, uh, be a farmer, till the soil, and never work a public job for anybody else. And one of the reasons I was able to do that is that you have to keep records. And so here's a book that I would buy Actually, it opened muggy, and it would help keep me records. And uh, you can see this is me up top, and, uh, and Lee Arthur was commonly called L.A. And then that was one of my boys, Claude, and my daughters, Mary and Pat, and then Micah. And then we had the neighbors would come, and they would also work in our fields. And so Reggie and Matthew and Roy, those were other kids uh, that lived close by. And then Rosie is my wife. And uh, Vern is my another one of my daughters, but this uh, uh, so I would get 
get one of these books each year and keep records. And also, being a, uh, a farmer, we, had to, we were very diverse back in those days. We didn't just have cattle. We had uh, farming. We had crops. We had vegetables. We had watermelons. We had fruit and all of those different things. So also in this book, it would out, this is a, a calculator. It's not like the modern calculators that you do by your, with your fingers, but you can work it, and you can see where I, this was on, where we would use this when we were peeling cotton, and um, this, you could, right here is where they were making $1.75 for 100 pounds of cotton, and they had pulled 300 pounds, and they got 525, and then 500 pounds, and they got 875. So that, those two added together would have been the 800 pounds. You can see over here, it shows you uh, how to do it on a dollar twenty-five per hundred. If you had two hundred pounds at dollar twenty-five, that would be two fifty. You had 15, 15 more pounds would be a dollar twenty-five, and three pounds would be a, a, a four. Uh, Fifteen pounds at dollar twenty-five would be nineteen cents. Three pounds at a dollar twenty-five would be four cents. So two hundred and uh, it, how many pounds that is is going to come up to $2.73, 218 pounds. So some of the other things that, that's in this book that, we, uh, that I was able to use because we wasn't always able to uh, have a uh, call a veterinarian, pay a veterinarian. So common remedies for livestock. So, you know, some of, just a few of these is like boric acid is a non-poisonous antiseptic solution, 20 grams to one ounce of water for treating uh, sore eyes and sore mouth. And then uh, castor oil, cloves uh, two to four ounces, sheep four ounces, pigs two ounces, and, and so on. So it was just a, a list of different things, Vaseline down at the bottom. Uh, so then, but the one, the probably the bigger thing would be the weights and measures. And so, how many people know how many four inch, how many, Hands, how many inches is in a hand? We used to measure the horses by hands. So there's four inches in a hand. In a cubic, there's 18 inches in a cubic. 12 inches in a foot. Six feet is a phantom. Three feet is a yard. And so, and so on and so on. You got 40 poles is a furlong, one furlong. And so 1,760 yards or 5,280 feet is a one equal one mile. You had to, we, we had ways of measuring our fields and things like of that sort. Uh, measures of surface, uh, 144 square inches is one square foot. Uh, 40 square yards is, is one root. Um, a gunner's chain is 22 yards or 100 lengths. So, and one thing, the one thing that we use nowadays a lot is we know that what it is, 43,560 square feet is in an acre. And then you have the solitary uh, measurements. Um, eight quarts is a peck. Uh, and this really comes in handy when you're selling fruit and vegetables. Uh, four pecks is, equals one bushel. Eight bushels equals one quarter. Uh, 36 bushels is a cauldron. One bushel equals 200 and 100, 2,150 and 42 cubic inches. Liquid measure. Four gills is a pint. Two pints is a quart. Four quarts is a gallon. 32 and one half gallons is a barrel. And 54 gallons is, a, is one hog shed. So that, those are some different uh, measurements that we, we learned to use back in those days. So here we have uh, this uh, uh, hay, a semi with a load of hay on it. But I started out uh, with a, a stationary hay baler back in the oh, back in the in the 30s or for, in the 40s. Started out with that stationary hay baler, and then we graduated. And I don't have a lot of pictures of this because we were busy hauling hay, but we graduated and kept getting more and more equipment. And so we bailed hay all up and down through the country uh, in, uh, between Muskogee and Oak Muggy. And uh, we bailed hay for a lot of black ranchers. 
some of those black ranchers uh, was uh, T.J. Rice, Commodore Collins, Herbert Collins, and, uh, and, there, and uh, oh, Mr. Willie Hall, um, Lawrence Walker, um, just to name a few. But there were many uh, rancher, black ranchers and uh, uh, black landowners back in those days that had cattle and, and grew hay. So we, uh, but at this point in the 70s, well, we were peeking out and uh, we were actually bailing hay on Highway 16 and uh, the sea mines were coming up from Texas and we were loading them out and they were sending them, we were sending them back to Texas. This is my oldest daughter, uh, Norma. It's, that's at the old farmhouse there. And this is the church, which was a very integral part of our growing up. It was uh, uh, about, I don't know, six, seven miles from the house. But every Sunday morning, we headed that way at many Wednesday nights. Uh, and that's the pastor, me and my wife, and Micah standing there. So this is my wife and uh, the four boys and my, my uh, daughter, uh, Rosalie. Rosalie is leading the, the charge out to the, to, the, to the church house today. And uh, Claude is holding my baby, the baby boy, and then Micah, and then Charles, and then my, uh, one of the older daughters is uh, coming in behind. But uh, wouldn't be for Rosalie that I never would have been able to done this by myself. So I just I thank God for her and all of her cooking and sewing and making clothes and all those things that she did on the black farm to make that to make it all work. We had to, we had planted peach trees and different things in our yard. We'd probably been in the house about maybe uh, ten years probably. And this is the church. This is my, uh, one of my boys. Hey, he's already grown and going home. He was a pastor. He's actually pastoring a church. That's the pastor's wife. But here is uh, uh, my, my wife and the baby boy coming out of the church. And then uh, there's some of the other family coming out, some of the other members, church members. But then at the end, uh, uh, my mother comes out. Now, this is the mother of the church. She's the mother of the church, but also she could fix fence with any man that was out there. And so you see the pastor coming behind her. Uh, so, and then... Uh, that's me again. Uh, once I got a welder machine, I was very dangerous. The many different things that I've done with a welder. And so this is that first diesel tractor that we got some 20 years after we got the farm on. And it was the first four plow tractor. And so that really changed things. We were so excited. Uh, I think that and uh, we were able to do a lot more land quicker uh, because of the, being able to pull four plows at a time. So this is uh, one. This is uh, my brother, my son Claude on the David Brown. This is probably 1968, maybe after a year after we got the white tractor, the, D the David Brown. The green tractor was the first John Deere that I bought. I never bought a John Deere until they made a four cylinder. And so in 1965, I bought a John Deere. In 1960, John Deere revamped their whole system and decided they were going to make four cylinders and six cylinder tractors. And so that was a good tractor. And, but it was the smallest one that John Deere made. Is what I, I bought it brand new, and then I bought the David Brown. And uh, but even in 1968, there were still farmers in our community that still used the horses in the in the mules. And this was the same day that that I was in the field with the planter and the David Brown. Uh, Mr. Enoch Adbury was cultivating in the field next to me with his horses and mules. This was not uncommon from, from some of the older farmers that was in our area. But anyway, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the kids going to school on the bus. I want to talk about that. Uh, so being in a black community in, in those days in the 60s, of, 50s and 60s, uh, it was se still segregation until 1966, I believe it was. And so uh, the buses wasn't, real, wasn't the best. And so they, uh, uh, they was always getting stuck. <laughs> and so one day, uh, the, uh, the bus got stuck, and it's probably five miles out of town. It's a mile, mile, two miles from, the, from, from home. 
And so my oldest boy jumps off the bus and starts running to the house to get the tractor. Because it's the, the danger is there's nobody really got telephones, and we don't know how much gas, how long the bus can run on gas, and it's cold and all this stuff. So he runs and he gets the farm all tractor and he runs back, runs it back there and he starts hooking it up. But Mr. Willie Hall, he's, he's another older farmer that still has his mules. He, he lives around the corner. And so he comes around that corner and he tells uh, Lee Jr., he says, uh, unhook that piece of, that iron, piece of iron, and uh, let me hook these mules to that bus. And so uh, my, my son, being a respectable son that we, we raised him to be, Move the tractor out the way. Mr. Willie Hall hooks the mules up to the bus, and then he walks out in front of them, and he calls them by their name, and then he calls the lead mule, and then tells them to, to come to me. And they begin to lean forward, and they get down, and they start to look like they're about to crawl. And then the bus starts to move out, and he pulls that bus out. And so, uh, but that's the, as we had already went on into to tractors, some of those older farmers, he, he kept his mules to the day he died. So uh, that was an interesting day. And then 19, I want to talk about uh, 1961, when uh, uh, the kids all get on the bus. They've done all their chores. They walk about a mile down to catch the bus because we lived a quarter mile off the road, but the bus didn't come up in front of our house. It came about a uh, half a mile down the road. So they had to walk the quarter mile and then the other half a mile. So three quarters of a mile they had to walk. Uh, but some of the, one of my boys, he actually had already went down to my grandmother's house and milked cows. So he had walked two quarter mile. He had walked a half a mile already that morning. My sister had fixed breakfast. My, old, uh, my oldest daughter cooked breakfast and everything. And so they all struck out to catch the bus. And so they, they're on the way to school, and, uh, and all of a sudden, I look down the road, and there's a guy that's flying. I'm like, oh, my God, what is, what's, that's Roy Fulson. What's, what's going on? Something has done happen. Something, I already can feel it in my soul. And so he comes, and he says, all the kids are being rushed to the hospital in Muskogee. They were on the way to school, and two cars were racing, and the one car went through the intersection, the other one, hit the bus in the wheels where uh, my son was sitting on the, where the hump was. And it rolled the bus completely over and back up on the wheels again. And it threw one of the kids out. And thank God it didn't roll over again. But as I got this news, and we not having a phone, Roy uh, Fulson's mother had a phone. She was a landowner, a black landowner that was a little more well off, and she had a phone, and so she had got to do before the bus could retract. They would send a bus back to retract to tell everybody, but he beat them there. And so he, uh, that day, it was five of my kids on the bus, one boy and four girls. But the oldest boy had kept him home to do some farm work, and that was a miracle in, in its own because my condition with five kids being a wreck, I wasn't in any shape to drive to Muskogee, but he was able to drive me over there. And so we, we get over there, and thank God they're all living. And uh, we had to get my oldest, my oldest daughter dress had blood all over it. And so when we got back home, we had to explain that to mother, to, to my wife, that it really wasn't her blood. It was the kid that fell out next to her and fell over on her on her lap. But uh, John... The boy that was in there, he was dragging his leg around. He broke his leg in two places, and he uh, was trying to find his sisters. And, uh, and they, he was wound up the worst, the worst one hurt. And he wound up in the hospital for probably, I think, two months. And so this was in a, a March of 61. Uh, and that's where he, uh, they get, uh, he graduated to the next class because they brought him the test, and he passed the test. So... That's where you got to get your class. You keep up with your classes. But anyway, he uh, broke his leg in two places. They kept him over there. And I'm farming. In March, he's just getting into April. That's when you got to get ground broke. You got to get everything ready, try to get everything prepared for this coming year. So I wasn't able to go over and see. He was in that hospital for probably two months. 
but only could go over there on Sunday after church. So he was in the hospital all that time by himself. But now he's a, this boy has been passing a church for some 50 years, so I think he was talking to the Lord while he was in the hospital. So, um, but everybody lived except the one kid that was in the car that was either a passenger or driving. And actually, John was in the ambulance with him and remember the date, the time when he passed, as he passed away. But it was just a traumatic deal, but it was a miracle that nobody on the bus got killed. But what, what, we, what I realized back in them days, even though it was segregation, before desegregation, it was segregation, it was all, the black community all came out in station wagons and cars and everything. They just, just like when, they, when a bus would get stuck, they would all come and try to help. And so it was a really close-knit uh, community. Uh, maybe things that you probably wouldn't do today because, you know, with uh, safety and all this stuff. But they came and, and piled kids in cars and took them to Muskogee, which was about 20-something miles away. And so uh, that was a, a, dramatic, a dramatic thing there. That's, that brings us up into the 60s and into the 70s with our hay bailing and our farming and all the things that we did uh, to get our kids pretty much almost grown. And so I'm going to change my hat at this point. So I'm back Micah Anderson, the son of L uh, Lee Arthur Anderson. And uh, you can see that's me here where we got a load of hay there. And then after I went to uh, work for the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, uh, I was growing watermelons. And uh, you can see the, early on before I went to the Department of Agriculture, I was working at the Ford dealership. And, uh, and then when I got into the horticulture program at the Oklahoma Department of Ag, you can see the difference in those watermelons. Uh, that one got sunburnt, but that one was so much more healthier because of the foliage. As Micah Anderson, I was, uh, uh, the, I'm the first and the only black person that ever got the commissioner's uh, award in, at the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, uh, where my name is engraved in the, in the building there, uh, what, under the commissioner Terry Peach, and uh, my supervisor was Rick Maloney. But very proud to be able to make that accomplishment. So what I'm doing today, to this day at, at Langston University is mentoring new and young farmers for the future. Uh, so uh, these young kids uh, that you see in the pictures, uh, they are, uh, we are grooming them for the future in farming. But it's all had to do with my roots and growing up on a farm and uh, my dad uh, teaching me all the things that he taught me. That pretty much concludes my little uh, talk. And so uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening in.